Hello everyone, former Cabinet Secretary K.M. Chandrasekhar's autobiography of 40 years of his public service as a civil servant and diplomat gives a ringside view in Indian bureaucracy and politics as well. I can see him join me, but before that, let me give a quick introduction on it. It talks about the process of decision making in the Manmohan Singh uh, government. I am being joined by the author. So recently, the Supreme Court in its verdict on demonetization said, that the notification of 8th of November 2016 satisfies the test of proportionality as such and cannot be struck down on set ground. It also talked about the entire decision making process and the communication that happened between the RBI and the government of the day, elaborating that it should not be seen as undermining the RBI as an institution. There is an interesting paragraph in your book, sir, and I'm going to read that, where you say that, uh, that uh, you know, before the press conference, you're talking about one occasion, uh, before the press conference, Montek requested me to call Subarao and see if the Reserve Bank uh, could come out with a supportive package on the same day. Surely enough, an hour after the fiscal policy package was announced. Subarao announced further measures to ease liquidity. The combined effect was electric, unquote. How do you look at the functioning uh, and the equation between the government and the RBI then and in the present government of Prime Minister Modi? No, I'll tell you, so far as the, uh, what you mentioned, what I have written in my book, now, that was a time when the country was going through a severe economic crisis. Uh, and uh, generally, the approach was to somehow bail it out through a stimulus package. So, we it was not that we uh, forced the Reserve Bank's hands at all. It is just that they were also in the process of consideration of uh, such a move. So when it coincided with our move, we only said, if you can do something at this time, it would uh, help in creating a larger effect. So that uh, the Reserve Bank governor was pleased to agree. And he decided to, uh, uh, to uh, announce those measures also within an hour. Now, demonetization is not a thing I know of. I was not in government at that time. I was, uh, I am, I was like you, an outsider. I don't know what processes they went through, and uh, whether there was sufficient time given to the uh, Reserve Bank, whether they were also considering demonetization. I couldn't tell you uh, what are the facts of that case. Okay. But I can only talk to you about what was done at that time. Okay, so basically I'm looking at the decision-making process and this paragraph appears to be like UPA dictating measures to RBI, which is a sovereign body. No, that is not true. What, is actually, what was actually happening is that we were all concerned. The Reserve Bank, the Government of India the Planning Commission, all of us were concerned about uh, doing something for the economy, which was in a very bad shape at that point. You know, the uh, subprime crisis of the United States had spread to almost all countries and uh, it had uh, affected India also. So it is not that we forced them to do anything. They were planning to do it and they did it. Uh, the, the timing was excellent because when it comes along with a stimulus package for bailing out the economy, the totality of the effect is tremendous. Okay. Uh, you were the cabinet secretary from 2007 to 2011. And that was the period that India was shaken by 26-11 terror attacks that took place in Mumbai. You have in depth spoken about what was happening at that time. You have written in your book, sir, that 26-11 also exposed weakness at the highest level in decision making in a grave emergency. Well, as I have mentioned in detail in my book, there was a problem 
regarding decision making uh, in a crisis. You see, uh, in the early years of the cabinet secretariat, the entire issue of uh, intelligence security was handled by the cabinet secretary. Later, during uh, Vajpayee's government, the position of NSA was uh, created. Basically, the idea was that a more focused attention is required, and then also that there are NSAs in the US and other countries with whom the Indian NSA could interact. Uh, it was to cover both foreign relations and the internal security. Now, what happened was that when this division took place, some part of it still remained with the cabinet secretariat. That is basically the thought was that when there is a crisis, the cabinet secretary will intervene. Uh, otherwise, entire intelligence reporting will go to the NSA. Okay. Now, that is a very uncomfortable arrangement because uh, the uh, cabinet secretary will be required to handle a situation like uh, 26 uh, 11 without knowing the background, without knowing the uh, intelligence inputs that might have come or might not have come. I mean, right from the beginning, as I said in my book, my batchmate in RNAW said very clearly that I cannot share intelligence information with you. I can only share it with the NSA. That's good enough. I mean, I have no complaint about that. But when there is this mismatch in the information available to the cabinet secretary and the information available within the system, then it becomes difficult to handle a crisis. One doesn't really know what was the crisis. The state government also didn't know. The state government was for a long time thinking that it is some kind of a gang warfare. And it was only later, uh, towards the night, that uh, they realized, they asked for some support, they asked for uh, marine commanders. They, I, I uh, spoke to the naval chief, and the naval chief was kind enough to provide the marine commanders. Then they realized that uh, they cannot handle it at all. That is when I telephoned the, the chief secretary, he said, send the MSG. Sir, so, you know, uh you have written elaborately about 2611 and what was happening then. You are saying here that there was no clarity on what was to be done at the central level. What was happening then? This will surely be seen as some kind of apathy on terror. No, what I, uh, the, what really was going wrong was that I was handling a crisis without knowing the background. This is the, uh, without knowing all the intelligence inputs, etc. So the intelligence had not been tied up properly. And uh, we re I, this is a thing that affected the whole country. I mean, it's not that I would have made a great difference at that time. But uh, the kind of reports uh, that came subsequently said that there were some inputs which were available to the intelligence agencies. It was available to military intelligence. It was available to the intelligence bureau. It was available to RNAW. These things could not be put together. And I have said in the book also that subsequently after uh, Mr. Chidambaram took over, uh, he started a process of regular meetings, you know, daily meetings. Uh, putting all these intelligence agencies together, realizing that this uh, kind of a gap was existing. And uh, I was also asked to look at all the measures to protect the coastline. So accordingly, we took a series of measures uh, to protect the coastline. We brought the state government in, we brought the Coast Guard in, we brought the Navy in. Uh, maritime uh, developed maritime boards were created, coastal maritime boards, uh, police station, marine police stations were strengthened. So lots of things were done. You had great uh, uh, working equation with uh, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, but you also talk about administrative tension and elaborate how uh, he did not take uh, personal interest in government management 
uh, what does it actually mean? What I meant was those are two different things. I had excellent relations with Dr. Manmohan Singh. Now, so far as governance reform is concerned, I do believe and I continue to believe that uh, the idea that by changing personnel, you are going to have good management, that's not going to work. You need serious systemic change because uh, uh, the public administration is not like corporate governance. Corporate governance, you have a clear objective. You have to make profit, you have to increase the stock value. Public administration, you have to help look at social welfare, you have to look at health, you have to look at uh, education, number of different things. And as governments change, these priorities also change. So there are two different things. So what you require is a systemic change. And uh, with the result framework document, what we intended to do was taking this difference into account, bring in a result-oriented system. This is the, what has been tried out in the uh, United Kingdom in Thatcher times. It has been adopted by Australia, by New Zealand. It has been now adopted by a number of Commonwealth countries. So I somehow, perhaps my failure, I could not get uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh also interested in this. And uh, subsequently also, even after I left, the system was continuing, but then it fell into disuse. Uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, you, are, you have written that uh, no prime minister or cabinet minister or cabinet collectively took any interest in this initiative. I'm going to elaborate a little more. These are your words. It was never driven from the top by the political executive, uh, as was in the case in other countries, which had effectively introduced systemic changes through new public management and other similar mechanisms. Uh, unquote. Why is it that there was no support from the political bosses? Oh, there were one or two reasons. One of course was that there was a bit of free fear was created by a couple of uh, insensitive media reports. You know, there was somebody who went around saying that ministers are going to be given marks. And that is how they're going to be judged. That was not the intention. The intention was to create a result-oriented system. But uh, uh, this uh, created little fear uh, at the top level, and they didn't want any part of it. That's probably one of the reasons. Secondly, you know, in government, the amount of work that happens, particularly in that period 2007 to 11, when we had a series of crises, uh, the... the, the Attention would not have gone to this area to this extent. There were a number of things, political crises, uh, uh, the economic crisis, the 26-11, as you mentioned, terrorism, all these, and uh, the extremism, the left-wing extremism, all these things were there. So the administration always tends to get a kind of uh, short shrift in such situations. Uh so you, your book certainly has those insights which uh, uh, Shashi Tharoor has said that, and I would agree with him, that the behind the scenes of insights, the process of decision making, uh, it's, it's very candid and it's full of uh, rich views. Uh, in the context of Aadhaar cards, uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, uh, you say there was no intention even to issue Aadhaar cards. It was only after Prime Minister Modi recognized the advantages of the Aadhaar and decided to link it to the wide range of government activities that the Aadhaar card came to occupy the position of preeminence that it presently does. Uh, why do you think uh, the significance and importance of Aadhaar was never understood then? You see, the significance and uh, you, the initial idea was that uh, it should be possible to identify everybody. The issue of uh, citizenship and Aadhaar card, the Home Ministry was also going on another route, which again is being followed now, as you know, with the National Citizenship Register and so on. That was supposed to be a, uh, 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 the, um, the, the proof of citizenship. 
Now here, this was only a kind of supportive measure that was thought of. Uh, it was not intended that this will be used on a wide scale. But I think uh, Mr. Nandan Nilakani, brilliant person, he had a long talk with the present prime minister and they decided to integrate it to with many welfare schemes. So you have direct benefit transfer using uh, Aadhaar cards. You have uh, many other, uh, you even now linking it to voter ID cards, also, if, even though on a voluntary basis. Now, this is, of course, a double-edged weapon because uh, we must also understand that India is a highly, uh, I mean, it's the level of literacy is low. The level of computer knowledge is low. So to, to a certain extent, it can also cause certain problems in rural areas and among the very old people. Even I find it very difficult to handle some of the things, including things like, you know, we have to every year prove that we are alive. Mm -hmm. So otherwise you don't get pensions. <laughs> so that, that requires a process. So this mm -hmm. is uh, something, uh, I mean, it's a double-edged kind of thing, but uh, it's happened. And uh, it's, I mean, in the long term, I think it's a good thing. Uh, my last question to you, sir, this 300 uh, pages in, in, in this book actually explore multiple layers of public service as, as someone who has uh, lived those years. When you look back, is there something that you wanted to do and you could not? Yeah, I would have certainly liked to do much more on administration. That uh, somehow never came out. I would have liked to develop a good uh, uh, a performance assessment system. I would have liked to develop the result framework bottom because it stopped at the initial stages itself. It didn't develop any further. I think those were uh, areas where I couldn't do enough. I, I I mean, I mentioned in the book also, if you, if you have read it, in many places, in many jobs, I made mistakes. I also did some good things. That's the, that is the life of every uh, IAS officer, of every civil servant. You cannot have a completely blemish-free life. So uh, uh, overall, I think I enjoyed my work. That was interesting. I enjoyed working with the people I worked with. I learned a lot and I continued to learn a lot. So right. that's uh, how I see my career. All right, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Kim Chandrasekhar there, the author of the book. It's an autobiography that he recalls all those years and the decision-making processes that was there when he was the cabinet secretary under Dr. Manmohan Singh government. Thanks so much for watching.